<clears throat> so hello, my name is Michelle Singer. I'm the adult programs coordinator for the Kellogg Hubbard Library. It is my privilege to coordinate Poem City. And this is Poem City 2022. And Poem City is presented by the Kellogg Hubbard Library. It's our celebration of National Poetry Month. And this is our 13th year. This year we have 250 poems, 22 programs, and art and poetry exhibits uh, downtown Montpelier, Berlin Mall. We've got lots going on this year. I really wanna thank our sponsors, National Life Group, Vermont Humanities Council, Hunger Mountain Co-op, and the Vermont College of Fine Arts, the Poetry Society of Vermont. We could not do this without them. Uh, we do ask folks to stay muted during the reading. We will open up for Q&A uh, that you can do by voice at the end. You can also put your questions in the chat and we will pitch them to the poets at the end. We are recording, as you know, and the video will be available on the library's YouTube channel. It will also be posted to the library's website, Poem City page. So you can find it there and you can tell your friends it's there. It is now my pleasure to introduce our poets tonight. We have Peter Murphy, Tom Schmidt, and L.R. Berger. Peter Murphy is the previous Dean of Academic Affairs at, Co at Goddard College, right here in our neighbors, Plainfield, and author of Maps of Three Continents and Underwater. Tom Schmidt has published two poetry chapbooks, Enough to Drink or Drown and Like a Metaphor. He received a PhD from Cambridge University and taught humanities for 30 years in California, Oregon, and Vermont. L.R. Berger was visiting artist at the American Academy in Rome and has been granted residencies in the McDowell Colony, the Blue Mountain Center, Hedgebrook, Wellspring House, and the Hermitage. Her collection of poems, The Unexpected Aviary, received the Jane Kenyon Award for Outstanding Book of Poetry. She will be reading from her new book, Indebted to Wind. I welcome you all here. It's a pleasure to be together. It sounds like we're coming in, we're through the miracle of Zoom, we're coming in from all over the country to experience poetry together. And we are going to start with Peter Murphy. Okay. Uh, let me just do a couple of things here. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, okay, well, I'm just going to start. Um, first, I want to thank uh, the uh, Kellogg Hubbard uh, Library for uh, inviting me to read. And um, I just need to get the technology straightened out. I'm, I can't quite, I need to get it off of the gallery and onto me. Oh, geez, honey, I'm sorry. I don't know how to do that. Can you just start? You've yeah. got a whole bunch of people waiting That's for you okay. to start. Do you want to get it onto speaker view? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Up at the top, there's a little uh, icon that says view. And if you push that, you should be able to toggle between speaker and gallery. Yeah. If you hover not, your arrow. Not on my view. iPad. I'm oh, sorry. on the iPad is always different. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. No. That's all right. I'll, I'll just read. I'm assuming you can see me. You Maybe can. I there we go. Okay. Oh, here I am. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for all that. Okay, so the book is called Underwater, and it's available from uh, uh, Amazon Books. Um, you have to go to the book section and uh, look under Peter F. Murphy, uh, and it's available there. I'm going to start with the, uh, the title uh, poem. It's called uh, Underwater, um, and I'll just get started. Jimmy tipped the murk over the transom, almost following it in. Precautions seeped out with the smell of closing time. It's not the water, it's the air that makes traps rust. In the river, they'd be fine. The minute they break the surface, they start to rot. We traced his line all morning in the hope of a beaver to nail round for a coat or a mink we'd stretch skinny on a board rub smooth. Bounty to cover bar tabs and calm alimony's rage. Jimmy curved the spring over the trap's blunt jaws past a trigger filed thin. He cracked black ice and placed the trap in a run among the weeds. His fingers half frozen 
He never tripped the pan. The stop loss holds their head back so they can't chew off a leg. Muskrat saddles, fried and chicken gizzards would be payment enough. That's from growing up in Alexandria Bay, New York in the heart of the Thousand Islands. Uh, <clears throat> this one is called, This Makes for Peace and is for Joan Murray, who's a fine poet and I highly recommend you checking her out. Do not say today's children don't care and tomorrow's won't either. If today's sun doesn't rise, tomorrow's won't either. Only your indifference will impair the quest for calm, not just before the storm, but long after the last bomb kills us all. You may impose your plan for war on the innocent. It would be like you to declare war on the innocent while you, ecstatic in the throes of a sublime ecstasy, would know a peace treaty from a declaration of war. Insensitive to the needs of a planet stretched to its limits. A planet so stretched to its limits, its defenders are now active in their own struggle to remain alive. When the earth dies, nothing survives. And this one's a little lighter, it's called Maybe. She asked if I had a record. I thought, jail time, bail money, lawyer's fees. She meant a CD, a signed contract, live performances with fans. She asked if I liked pets. I thought, cats, dogs, a goldfish or two. She meant a python, two black widows, a half a dozen parakeets, and a gerbil in a large cage with a wheel. She asked if I wanted a family. I thought, children, sometime, down the road, maybe. She met her father, three or four siblings, both sets of grandparents, and a couple of kids from at least one other marriage. She asked if I could drive. I thought, my own car around town into the next county on occasion. She meant an 18-wheeler, cross-country, overland and return. She asked if I loved her. I thought, forever, without a doubt, in sickness and in health. She meant right then, that moment, maybe on into next week. And this one <clears throat> is called A Woman. She preferred women to men, my mother, short, stocky women who could protect her in a bar fight and stand up to a man. She liked women with money, generous to a fault, women who could pay more than their fair share of the tab. She had rules, my mother, no hustlers, no floozies, no tarts, no fakes. She wanted a woman with class, not a pain in the ass. No uptight women or women too tight. No slight women or out all night women. No ingenues, no darlings, no dykes. She was ambivalent about dykes, flannel shirts, work boots, the swagger. Not ladylike enough for my mother. She might like a girl from the streets, but not the back alleys. A woman of town just not all over town. No girl Friday over Saturday for a little something on Sunday and stay all the next week. What she wanted, my mother, was a woman to love her and leave her alone. And this one is what I call an alphabet poem, and it gives you a sense of what the next book is about. About half of the next book are out, out, out alphabet poems. I find these incredibly therapeutic at a time when insanity seems to be, prevail. So I thought I would read this one from, from this book. 
uh, it's called Riff on E. Early Earls entered Eden ecstatic. Everywhere everyone ended elegant edged ears. Elephant eras elapsed. Equilibrium eating egrets, enthusiastic elongated Eric. Elevated elms, evergreens, embossed events. Evaporated ecstasy emitted ewes ever down. Estimated evasions elastic. Exuberance erroneous. Enemies, enemas, even evacuated enameled entropies. Entertaining E. coli, effervescent, eloquent. Edsel's extended executive excellence, exacto. Uh, the thing I will say about the alphabet poems is that I'm, I'm interested in the narrative. So the alphabet poems, the narrative is driven by the words, but I'm not just interested in coming up with a lot of words. I want the words to come together uh, to tell the story. Okay, and then I'm gonna end with um, a new one also, I mean a new one. Uh, and this one, the good news on this one is that it's in rhyme cutlet, cut, couplets and um, I think it moves right along. It is a lot of fun to write and it's a lot of fun to read. Uh, this is called Snarly McNarly. Snarly McNarly went to the fair, pulled off her wig and showed them her hair. Mrs. McNarly, the officer sighed, what will you wear the day you die, given your outrage here on earth? Will you cover your shame and hide your girth or tell your tales about giving birth? And what's it all worth, Snarly McNarly, if you're so wise, tell us now before sunrise. Snarly McNarly set in her ways, yanked up her blouse and showed them her stays. Ah, Constable McThriller, Snarly replied. I tell you the truth, but you know I'd lied. Snarly McNarly, you wicked old hag. When you drop your stays, what else will sag? Under her bonnet and above her nose, the curls now flat to the tip of her toes. Snarly McNarly, alone with her gang, boxed their ears until they rang. The gang took after her in hot pursuit, chased her a mile down an unused route. She sang them a tune she'd learned when at school about a rich, smart Alec and his friend, the fool. Snarly McNarly knew how to dance. She crossed her legs and dropped her pants. She yelled from the rafters far above, something about lust not being love. Mrs. McNarly, have you lost your mind? Pull up your bloomers and hide your behind. Hurry up, please, and come down from there. You're not so good in such thin air. Charlie McNarly sought the ground and set off straight for where she was bound. She was hoping for heaven, but thought more of hell as she lit out the back door and over the hill. Stop where you are, she heard him cry, turning to look him straight in the eye. Officer McThriller, let me be clear. You're a sweet man, a kind man, a dear. But Mr. McNarley comes home tonight, and the last thing I want is an endless fight. Snarly McNarley, you irascible wench. How in the world can you stand the stench? When Mr. McNarley arrives in his cups, you know and I know he'll never get up. Officer, officer, I hear your sad plea. Oh, what, oh, what is to become of me? I sit here all day when not running around, looking for comfort in this one horse town. Snarly McNarly, what's it to be? Me and you or you and he? Tell me now before I go mad, are you going with me or that worthless cad? I'll make it as plain as it can be. I'm afraid it's not you, but rather he. So sow your seeds where you may, boys, tomorrow, today, next year. And remember, I tried to be true, boys, when not spending my time with you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Next up, Tom Schmidt. 
Hi, it's good to see all of you faces from near and far, friends and family. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, a few words of introduction. My, uh, my academic life began in prestigious traditional institutions, but some of my richest experiences occurred just before I retired working part-time in what some would call the basement of the ivory tower, a rural community college, an amalgam of single moms trying to escape the trailer park, veterans shaking from PTSD, high school flops grasping at one last chance, and more often than you might guess, gifted intellectual seekers who, but for the accident of birthplace would have done just fine in the Ivy League. It is these all but voiceless students whose voices I adopt in my recent chapbook, Like a Metaphor, rendering their stories into poems. And a few of those I'll share with you tonight. This first group are uh, true stories that all began with a freshman assignment. Write about a common object that has significance only to you Consider how that object may represent you, then bring it to class to describe. Hector Garcia brings a little blue towel to class. 10 hours, six days, he pulled green from brown soil, life from yellow kernels. Grandfather's grandfather smelled of it. No one asked him why, but my grandmother told me he once laughed and said he could only close his eyes at night when he saw no hunger in hers. After classes, I'm at Auto Splash where cars line up like stalks of maize, soap and wax on chrome, spray shine on black tires. I smell of it. Eight hours, six days, I rub. At night, I close my eyes on a thousand towels but tomorrow I return laughing. You ask me why? I have not seen my grandmother in years and you have never seen my daughter. Margola brings an old necklace to class. You may recognize this form as a villanelle. A blood red garnet, gilded filigree, my Nana sent the necklace next day air. The day after she died, it came to me. Mere costume stuff, no value I could see, bent clasp and broken chain beyond repair, a blood red garnet, gilded filigree. A note from her last nurse supplied the key to open up the keepsakes when and where. The day after she died, it came to me. It made the journey inexplicably from Lodz to Bergen-Belsen to Bel Air. A blood red garnet, gilded filigree. A common bauble prized uncommonly. Not gem, but journey rendered it so rare. The day after she died, it came to me. I grasp it now, this broken, worn debris, and know of whom, not what. I am the heir, a blood red garnet, gilded filigree. The day after she died, it came to me. John brings a big click to class. I'm just gonna put this out there. In high school, I was popular and everything. I mean, captain of the soccer team and pretty good grades, but home kind of sucked. Anyway, I got this job part-time in an appliance store and my boss was so cool. He was like a mentor for life. Like who cares about appliances, right? But he'd take me to lunch and talk about stuff with me. And I don't know, it was just, well, it lasted two years, including last summer. And once he gave me this pen, that's the only thing he gave me. I mean, a thing I could touch. And I know it's like, it's just this cheap big click, no big deal. And I didn't think I was gonna lose it. Sorry, shit. I think I'm in love with him. Wow, I just said that. And I'm straight. Does that make any sense at all? God, I'm really blowing this, aren't I? Okay, anyway, here's this pen and I'm, I'm going to keep it. 
Sarah brings her green eyes and a Douglas fir sprig to class. After she left, his folks raised me. He was out with the crew six days a week, clear cutting mostly. I hate that. The ridge looks like a bad haircut, I said when I was nine, about a week before a Doug fur rolled over him. He laughed and said, yep, and they grow back just like hair too. He slept late Sundays, took me places. Before sleep, knelt next to my bed, crooned a slow version of brown eyed girl. Oh, daddy, my eyes are green, I said, but he said it's about the you and the my which I get now, and it's all I've got of him since that one time he wasn't looking, just that one time. The crew broke up and went who knows where. His folks took over, but they got in a car wreck, so now it's just me to remember if I do. It was a mistake floating his ashes like they did. Now the river's got him and it's gone, that particular water, I mean. When I was nine, just before the log, and I said that about clear cutting, and he said that about hair, I should have said no, with trees it's different. The ones that grow back aren't the same trees. And pretty soon, nobody's left to remember the ones cut down. Another assignment in a beginning writing class was to compose an essay during class responding to a prompt chosen by the professor. <clears throat> Happy place. So to be a nurse's aide, you have to take this dumb course where they make you write an essay in an hour and the directions say, describe a simple pleasure that figures highly in your life. And the teacher smiles like he's doing us a favor and says, find your happy place, but you're not allowed to fly around the room. Ha ha, what he don't know. Like in life, you don't write essays. And in life, happy places are way off somewhere when you were a kid, or if you're Wendy hoping for Neverland, off somewhere in the sky. But me, I gotta go off and clock in at the buy mart right after class. And anyway, it's hard to write with the hand he smashed with a bottle last night after he staggered in from his happy place. Headshot. My sergeant said, take him out. And you don't think, plus the guy was running at us low, plus I was scared. So I raised my arms, there was a pop and he was down, half his head, including where the eyes were just gone. And then what was left in that bone bowl kind of slid halfway out into a puddle and mixed with the rain. Yeah, sometimes it rains and gets cold in Kandahar. So here I am taking classes in American rain and cold, and the shrink they send me to says the right stuff about how I did what I had to, even though they never found any weapons on the guy. Like, what the fuck was he running at us for? And in the dreams, he keeps running without the top half of his head right up to me, grinning like he knows something I don't. I mean, where's it at, that part of my head? Vanilla, but stars. You said to write something that people might not believe. So here goes. But first, you need to know some other stuff. Like my husband, John, works hauling gravel for Copeland. Our girl, Emily, is 11. She's into Taylor Swift and texting. Our son, Jason, is six. He's into monster trucks and dinosaurs. We rent a little house here in town where we both grew up. I'm hoping to get an associate's degree. I'm not sure for what, but John says I'm the smart one. And anyway, all this so far is about as vanilla as it gets, but that's the point, how it started. Me and John were up in the Siskiyous right after his discharge, camping on a summer night, way up on top of Bolin Mountain. It was about two in the morning. We were looking up at the sky when this huge shooting star came down right in front of us in slow motion like it was going to land down in Bolin Lake. And just seconds later, a second shooting star came down and we saw um, also in slow motion. But then when our eyes followed the second star down, 
we saw in a clearing 20 feet away, two deer, a buck and a doe with their heads up. I swear they were staring at those stars too. We sat there and didn't say anything for maybe 10 minutes. The deer slowly walked away and John turned to me and said, will you marry me? And I said, yes, and that's pretty much it. We didn't tell anybody at first, we wanted it to be our secret. Later, when we told a few, we could tell they didn't believe us. And hey, if we hadn't been there, we probably wouldn't either. So we keep it now like a little treasure in a box. We have that when John gets his hours cut back, when the kids have the flu, when it rains, when it's all just vanilla. We still have the stars. This next one is in my voice. And what may be interesting about it is that uh, it was composed while students were writing an essay in class. Reach. Between black clouds, late fierce light slants a threat of storm on grass that students and scholars do not trod. No, we respect the paths made for us. This is the same grass I did not trod in a Cambridge courtyard where Isaac Newton once measured the speed of sound. I kept to paths. Now, in the interval between flash and boom, I calculate that none of us is far from the apple of gravity that drops near enough the path to reach. Finally, a true but bizarre story that occurred when I was teaching at a fancy prep school in Santa Barbara. The whole truth about half. A day or two before one school year's end, from underneath my corner desk, I slid my cardboard box of pedagogue supplies, a host of post-its, staples, markers, pens, and in addition, much to my dismay, a pair of hairy thighs with one bare tail, the nether end of one Norwegian rat. Intact and dry, no mark of knife or teeth, no blood, no nest, no droppings, not a clue accounting for its provenance or presence. I called in reinforcements. PhDs in history, biology, and math, the brain trust of our preppy little world. This fourfold Sherlock surely would rule out impossibilities and leave the truth. Our minds gnawed through the few alternatives. A carnivore or cannibal of rats begins with ends, no rodent left behind. But here are only haunches, nothing else, no bones, no turds. Absurd, the group concurred, and yet, no student craving fame would stash a desiccated rodent in a box where undetected it might lie for months. Moreover, whither went the headed half? A more expressive trophy to be sure, yet not a trace had graced another class. So round and round we chased our clever tales, scenarios successively ruled out, which left me as the literary one, no solace but of poetry. Alas, that once for me, someone gave a rat's ass. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Up next, we have L. R. Berger. That's better. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> well, the theme of our reading is what poetry can do. And um, so one of the things that poetry can do, which always means uh, what it does for and to the poet, as well as the reader, is engage the territory of loss. Uh, and a good deal of my book uh, is in it as a kind of experiment in different ways in doing that. So I'm going to be reading from the unexpected aviary. And I'm going to start with a poem titled Blue Yonder. 
this poem was actually written in some ways at the grace of Sue, who is uh, somewhere in the listening gallery, who invited me to her home um, in, in Maine, looking out on the marshes, blue yonder. The geese are going places flying west in formation, low over the tidal marsh. We're all going places, some of us flying low under evening sky, closer to the place we're all going to. There was a time I wanted to go with them, watch them coursing south across a late October field in the dream I woke from crying Take me with you, my body that night, the place they were passing through. I can still hear them calling, though they've flown out of sight, like the dead whom I also love, gone to their unimaginable places. Who knew I'd still be here, at home, at last, feet to, to, to good earth? Good luck, I holler with everything I've got, no trace of longing for any blue yonder. The next poem, um, I was asked at a reading what the title is Sheila's Marginalia. And I took for granted that everybody knew what that meant, but I found out that wasn't so. So marginalia, which is probably the bane of most librarians, the irresistible urge for commentary in the margins of the books that we own and borrow. So Sheila's marginalia. After she died, the books that were her friends went home with her friends. I buckled mine into the passenger seat, steering away from the home where she'd always refuse any facts supporting hopelessness, branding me traitor for answering, yes, it's true what they say, you are going to die now. That's how it is with the sturdy tugboat women call friendship. We haul in the oxygen tanks and crack jokes, redispensing vomited medication. We tell the kids, we phone the ex-husband, we declare bathing incontestable and ball without apology. We tack the note to her door she dictates before leaving on the stretcher for hospice, gone fishing. Surrounding the deathbed, we take all requests for songs, for touch, for chips of ice held to dry lips. Sing that one again. We hold the children. We comfort the children. We steal the rose from the styrofoam cup and strew its petals down over the heart waiting for the undertaker. Then we go home and await the ingenious means our dead friends devise to keep talking to us. Sheila's medium is her flair for marginalia in those books unpacked and shelved among my own 10 years ago. Just this morning over coffee, she said, listen to this, her five pointed star penned in blue beside, there are 84,000 Dharma doors always available to wake us. I reread that sentence, fingertip to star, her two penciled question marks above the chapter on reincarnation, waiting when I turn the page. And for those of us of a certain age, Time is tinkering with our memories. Another kind of um, experiment in losing, sometimes words. This poem is called Momentarily Untitled. 
what did I come into that room for? The name of that restaurant? The street where she lives? What was it no one told me? The post office box won't open with my house key. I thought it was still August, but this is where I live. What was it he said that made me leave him? Wasn't there a grudge or two? Who gifted me that carved wooden monk on the windowsill? Her first name started with a G. Is my password still swallowtail? That shrub mock orange until I remember its honeysuckle? Weren't there always mistaken identities? Did we see that movie? Did I enjoy it? Were his dying words to me everlasting joy or joy everlasting? So because um, Peter read his alphabet poem, I have a poem for the letter P, <laughs> uh, which started as a kind of warm up exercise, a kind of joke. But um, as poems at their best, do they override our own ideas about what they're about and they take us where we most need to go. So I was delighted to hear your e poem. So this poem is called, Because Hope Has Only One P. Preposterous has two, so I use it whenever possible, but only as it pertains to improbable splendor in its particulars. This morning it was one preposterously small boat whooping up the placid lake into stippled waves thumping at the pilings. A passion for peas makes it easy to pick your favorite anything, animal, porcupine, nuts, pistachio, French noun, parapluie. How do you think Prozac got so popular? The poet is early primed to parse past participles and pinch back superlatives. Prior to posthumous, pish on this. Let irrepressible, irrepressible play in P's backyard plenitude. That's where the pluck comes from, to take on those P's we believe we'd be better off without. Plutonium, apartheid, impoverish, corporate plunder. Take heart, it's the P in despot that patiently plots his toppling, all those P's, underground operatives, pledged to the painstaking piecework of our emancipation. P's ply under the radar, protected by their reputations for peace, polite, pretty please. They pack pitchforks for every possible impasse. Peas have telescopic outlooks. They're at home with complexity placed right there at the center of skeptical to trip over. Be a player. Apprentice yourself to the pea chipping away at complacency, persecute, apocalypse. Sketch that blueprint for unprecedented parity you who are also indispensable because hope only has its one P and there are no closing hours in this world's shop of perilous pastimes. Needless to say, I have a predilection for the letter P. The more P's in a word, the better. So that was fun. Um, after the murder of George Floyd, I waited quite a while to find 
the words really to wait for the words to find me um, to write about that moment in our collective history. And so the title of this poem is 38th in Chicago, which is where Floyd was killed, May 25th, 2020. They brought him down to the place where even wind couldn't save him. It tried. The wind gave him breath for, please, mama, please. But between that knee and his neck, there was no open passage for wind to wedge between them. Wind begged the mine belonging to that knee to come back from the country it was lost to. But that mind was drunk on dominion and clenched tight around whatever had killed the life-giving wind inside him a long time ago. How am I doing for time, Michelle? Do we have time for one more? You have time for one more. Okay. Wind is a character, its own character in the story of this book. So I'm gonna read the title poem, Indebted to Wind. Not what it had to say, but what it carried to you. Dandelion silk dispatching seed, the neighbor's trash can lid, waking you from that nightmare hurled in a tempest against the bedroom window. Howling, love cry, lamentation. Wind carries out the past and in the future, tutors your own breath to extinguish the flame. When love unbuttoned your blouse, wind did the rest, fumbling through the aspens. You could have believed air was empty space to be lost in, except for wind stinging your face at the height of January, whipping the flag, lifting the sparrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. That was such an interesting and wonderful mix of playful and really a lot of depth. Uh, uh, we want to open up now to other folks. If you'd like to, um, you can put questions or comments in the chat and I will read them. Or you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask the poets a question yourself. Yes, John. I see John, you've got your hand up. Um, I'm asking you to unmute if you wanna ask a question. Not able to. Anyone else? Can you put your question in the chat? I was struck by the alphabet poems. I've never written a poem uh, in that style. And I'm wondering, uh, I'll ask this to all three of you, if you were going to write another alphabet poem tomorrow and what letter do you think you would use? Well, I, let me respond because I, I think I maybe kind of started us off on this. Um, that's not, I mean, to begin with, um, for me, alphabet poems are, it's, it's not, they're not only driven by um, letters, though I really liked LR's, um, what I liked about yours was that you included words in which P appears in various places in a word rather than like my riff on E, they all begin with E, but, but, but so I, and I have a whole, 
I mean, they're a lot of fun to write. I just want to say that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I do have an A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way through to X. Though with X, I cheated a little and used EX because how many words do you know that actually begin with X? You know, I got, I don't know, maybe four. Um, so, so that he, here's, here's one example. And I, I wish I had, I, it's upstairs. Um, I, I should have run, I should have, uh, uh, dashed up there and got it, but here's an example. When I heard that Florida was going to pass a law banning the word gay, I immediately thought, what happens if you eliminate the syllable G with a long A. And if you eliminate G with a long A, then, then you know, what happens, right? Well, you can, there are a lot of words that you can't use. So for example, this poem is called Poor Florida and it begins something like this. I'm not really good at remembering <laughs> my poems. I really need to, to read them, but, it, but it's something like, you know, there's a, it's a riff on, Gatorade and Gators and Gainers and Gate and the list goes on. And that's what kind of, that's what moves me is I'm, I, I, I mean, I call them alphabet poems, but it's not just A, B, C, D. It's, it, it's all, um, and, and where it came from. And, that, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pass the baton here. But, but to some extent, the Puritans were really doing this um, when, when they, 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 would, they would write a poem and frequently it would be somebody's name and they were celebrating some great, you know, Puritan father usually. So, you know, what, whoever, you know, Cotton Mather. And then you, you would write, you know, you would write C words and then you would write so on and so forth. So I do a lot of that. That really helped me in the four years that that moron was in the White House because you could kind of riff on all sorts of names. So very therapeutic. Thank you. LR, I mean, P is obviously a big favorite, but what do you think would be next? I have no idea, which I mean, most of my poems are found poems. You know, mm. they, they, they find me and I attempt to follow them. Uh, where they lead and sometimes I can and sometimes uh, it'll be 10 years before I know how to do what the poem needs me to do so I can you do you see it or do you hear it or is it something else I hear it mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and you hear you you hear uh, a fragment that you then are building around yeah and then the fragments begin to have a conversation with each other yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. You're nodding your head. Oh yeah. Well, in appreciation, uh, I think one of one of the brief lines, if I understood it correctly, that stood out in LR's poem was a reference to the uh, the, the P being telescopic, and the the shape of the letter uh, is something that's lost and and bears exploration because. Our letters really or originated in pictographs, and we've mm -hmm. lost touch with, with that. But it's um, it's something the ancient Hebrews um, paid a lot of attention to, and in fact, the the idea of alphabet poems goes at least as far back as the biblical Psalms. So it's uh, it's a very old art, and uh, is being revived in the idea of, of the sounds and shapes of letters is being revived in rap music, really, which contains a lot of internal rhymes. And uh, and clever play on on uh, letter, especially consonant sounds. So, but I don't know where I'd begin. I think I'd just leave it to Peter and LR. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it may be that that will be my one letter poem. It may rest yes. there. Well, it was perspicacious. <laughs> Yeah, it can be fun. I have a uh, now eight-year-old, but since she's been four, we have a competition for P words. And we, we are constantly, the more P's, the more points you get. So <laughs> it is a lot of fun.
you know, one of the things, I don't know, is there, are there other questions, Michelle? Not, not that I'm seeing in any obvious way. Okay. Then I'd like to, to say a couple of words, if you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I just would really like to thank the, the three poets for um, a, a, an inundation of words and rhythms and expectations and forcing me to think outside, outdoors almost. Uh, lots and lots of uh, things to think about. It's very hard for me to listen to poems and then be able to comment on them very much. Uh, I would normally read a, a poem, <laughs> I don't know, 10 or 15 times before I had something useful to say about it. <clears throat> But there, there were a lot of um, uh, uh, impulses that came to me listening to you guys. Uh, little fragments, which is what I'm thinking about right now. Uh, and in Peter's poem, Underwater, I really loved the, the animals, the fish, uh, the little beaver, the idea of creatures that, that live in the water and have um, have a place there, and you know we we sort of mess with them, but uh, if we didn't, they would be very ha happy in their in their environment. Um, and I really liked his um, uh, the <clears throat> the uh, four words that you chose for the misunderstanding poem. I d I don't have the title of that. Maybe that was the alphabet poem. Um, where uh, love and several other words uh, took on meanings in one sense and then switched over to meanings in a totally different uh, understanding. That was great. Uh, Tom, I really liked uh, uh, the first poem you read, uh, the, little, the Little Blue Cow came to my mind <laughs> and that sort of stuck there. And I did like the Villanelle, terrific. I, that, that is such a hard form, oh my God. But um, because it was well done, I didn't notice the rhyme scheme very well. I love to read that again. I'm gonna have to get your book, yeah, both of you, you guys. I already have LR's book. <laughs> um, the, in the Villanelle, the, things, the thing that stu stood out for me was the jewelry, the, the blood red garnet with filigree. And that's a very um, clear image for me. And the way it was used in the poem is extraordinary. Um, well, there's a lot more to say about that. LR, I really enjoy your poems so much, as you know. And um, the, the study of the marginalia is great. <laughs> I being a person who always writes on the, in the margins. Um, I, when I went back to school, graduate school, I decided I'd better not write in the library books anymore. So I did get some post-it notes and I used those instead, <laughs> but it wasn't nearly as much fun. <laughs> um, and uh, one of your lines, the sturdy tugboat women call friendship. That is really great. Yeah. And, and such an image to go with the concept. Really wonderful. And uh, one more thing, I think. Um, the, the, the failing memories, which I guess all of us who are here in in this reading um, have some issues with failing memories and trying to make peace with the fact that that is happening. And the, the device you used at the end was just wonderful using two words that work very well, no matter which, <laughs> which mm -hmm. uh, order they're in. So thank you guys very much, it's been wonderful. Thank you, Sue. It's so nice to hear those those reflections. Roxanne.
Okay. Well, thank you. This was delightful. Uh, the, I went from laughing to crying to resonating to reacting over and over with, with these poems. It was just um, reassuring, I want to say, reassuring that the people are delving into these topics and sadly and touchingly and um, Tom was reading once about his kids that were just kids I remember working with and it um, just brought back memories and Peter you're hilarious and I just couldn't stop <laughs> laughing at several of your poems I want to now read them and Ella thank you our thank you for your touching um, words and um, anyway it was all delightful it was just so much reacting and resonating so quickly from poem to poem but all of you did a great job. I appreciate being invited. Thank you. Thank you. You want to, are you waving? <laughs> uh, you're muted. So I've, I've asked you to unmute if you want to say something. <laughs> it's going to be our tagline after the pandemic you're muted you know it's going to be something we all remember so well so you got it go for it Hi. can you hear me yeah okay um thank you it was wonderful um all of you thank you um i'm curious um do you have any um poets yourself whose sound memories of of verses uh that run through your head um, yourself and um, do you have any that particularly maybe in their rhythms or their um, humor or their metaphors or whatever particularly you think influenced you? Peter do you want to start since you're nodding your head? <laughs> well that's huge. Um, I had a, a, a teacher once who, who um, gave us as an uh, uh, assignment um, the, the, uh, uh, the challenge of writing what he called, write down a list of um, mentors and masters. And I found that, you know, initially you think, what the hell does that mean? But once you think about it, I, I found it incredibly helpful. So, you know, masters would be all of the great poets. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you, you may, you know them, you know their work, but they don't necessarily have a direct impact on your own work. The mentors are the people who you, the poets that you read, who actually influence you in the way you think about your own work. And for me, <clears throat> I'd have to say mostly American, um, mostly, um, mostly 20th century, though uh, Whitman is definitely an influence and Emily Dickinson, whose work I just love. I mean, if you're interested in rhyme, if you're interested in the image, I mean, she is just one of the great masters. And then, you know, just to, I mean, it's a long list in the 20th century, but Frost is an influence. William Carlos Williams, a major influence. Bob Creeley, another influence, you know, just, just lots of them. I mean, when I'm, when I'm interested in, I'm, I'm, I'm far less interested in poems written in the first person. And I'm far more interested in poems that are driven uh, by sound. I'm re uh, that's why I'm interested in these, um, you know, these new poems. It, it, for me, it's not just letters, but it's phonemes, syllables, because um, what I'm really, what I'm interested in is, is the sound. So, so even though I write narrative poems, I don't, I don't have a story to tell. I have a collection of words that drive the story. And it kind of, it kind of resonates with what LR said at, at, at some point, which is that you don't really, I mean, you think you have a plan, but you don't, 
at, at, at the best, what you have is three lines and you don't know how those lines relate. And they may not, what may happen is you may end up with two of those lines in this poem, throw one out that is never gonna work anywhere. And then you've got another line in some other poem. So it's, it's um, yeah. LR, I saw you nodding your head about sound. Oh, definitely. I, I think the, there are so many poets um, that have really shaped the music. The music of poems is really important to me, um, which is the sound. And I, I grew up on Dickinson. I had a, um, a grammar school teacher who was also a librarian. And, you know, when, when we talked about the theme, what poems can do, I mean, poems can save your life. And she, as a librarian, came in one day to the classroom and just put a book of Dickinson's poems on my desk. And I was never the same. And that book and her seeing me, how she knew who I was. But um, I, I really um, suckled on Dickinson for many years. She, was, she still is and was very important to me. Her use of, of sound and also um, the density of her images. Thank you. I think she was an imagist long before Pound. That's mm -hmm. my perspective, mm -hmm. you know, long before those guys. I'm really enjoying um, some of the, the contemporary new poets. Natalie Diaz um, mm. is just a wonderful poet. Um, some of you know her and uh, I've been, I, I've also been reaching back. I'm about to teach a class on Gwendolyn Brooks. Mm. And I've just been blown away again, going back to those poems. Just, oh my God, what a giant she was. So, yeah. You know Ross Gay's work? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's another one that comes yeah. out of that, that same um, tradition. Yeah. Tom, how about you? Well, I... Um... I read so much, I'm never quite sure where the influences come or whether the, the, the subject matter of the poems dictates the form or to some extent the style. I, uh, it might interest people to know that, I, I don't know if it's true for you, Peter or LR, but I sometimes, and my wife can attest to the fact that I sometimes wake up at three or four o'clock in the morning with a poem almost fully formed and I have to run downstairs and flip open the laptop and start getting it down. My, my theory is that my muse is actually a Greek goddess and it's about lunchtime for her <laughs> uh, time zone. And so she just, you know, she sends messages and I've got to wake up. Account for the time difference there. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. We're, we're, we're at our time. What a really lovely evening. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for celebrating National Poetry Month together from all over the nation. Thanks to our poets. Um, happy poetry, happy sharing. Um, this was a really lovely reading. Thanks for yeah, being thank here. You, thank you, Michelle. You're a wizard. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Peter and Tom. Yes. And to all of you who are here. We're, we're honored to uh, to do this with you. Yeah.